Hey guys, it's Thursday, Friday Eve, just a couple couple of days before Halloween. I don't know how trick-or-treating is going to go, but I'm sure the churchers will have trunk or treat for you guys, which will be fun. At least it's candy. All right, so where we left off with Quinn and Nick, um, Quinn had invited Nick over to her house to see his mom's, her mom's sculpting studio because she found out Nick was a really good artist. And then Nick was telling the story about how his dad made the comment that he's never going to be a professional football player if he kept doing his little drawings when he was six. That's pretty harsh. So we're going to pick up with him today. We're going to read three chapters today. Um, I'm actually going to be done by next Wednesday because I forgot next Thursday I have hopefully my final doctor's appointment and I'll be released to walk. All right, let's pick up chapter 13. Nick's first text to Quinn were about Tommy. Tommy couldn't drive for a month. Tommy couldn't use his phone. Tommy couldn't see his friends. Except for going to school and football, Tommy was grounded. He would be spending the next 30 days staring at the ceiling in his room or doing grunt work at their dad's construction site. Are you glad? Quinn texted Nick. And he texted back, why would I be glad? I don't know, because you want him to be punished? Nick took a while to respond. When he did, his answer surprised Quinn with its honesty. Maybe a little. Quinn's next question, although Nick might have thought it was random, was not, in her mind, a subject change. Meet me at the beach tomorrow a.m. We can walk to school. Nick, walk, question mark, or roll, your call. Nick, okay, Quinn, okay, which? Nick, okay, I will see you at the beach tomorrow. Quinn didn't push it. She texted a thumbs up. Now they're using texting slang in this. I'm just not going to spell it out. I'm just going to read it. Okay. So instead of saying Y W H Y, it's just the letter Y meet me at the beach is the at sign, that kind of stuff. Later that night when she was almost asleep, Nick pinged her again, old school TV, 1130 PM. Quinn, why are you still awake? Nick, why are you? Quinn, I was almost asleep. Nick, turn on your TV. Quinn, why? Nick, that show I told you about is on in five minutes. Quinn, seriously? Nick, yes. Quinn, can I just YouTube it from bed? Nick, no, we have to go old school at the same time so we can text while we watch. Quinn was tired, but she tiptoed downstairs in the pitch black and turned on the TV. Quinn, I don't know if we get that channel. What's the number? Nick, 88. Quinn punched two eights into the remote and got a Beachbody infomercial. Quinn, you want me to watch Beachbodies? Nick, wait. Quinn waited. She watched some orangey tan women in short shorts do butt crunches. They looked strangely happy about it. Then the ad finished and a man in a space helmet filled the screen. Nick, are you watching? Quinn, yes. She was watching. After the spaceman's rocket malfunctioned, he crashed into the ocean. There was a corny voiceover. Steve Austin, astronaut, a man barely alive. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. There were x-rays and body scans and doctors with scalpels installing the spaceman's new robot legs, new robot arm, and a new robot eyeball. Until suddenly, there he was, running down the street in a red sweatsuit to the world's cheesiest soundtrack. I'm smiling because I can hear it in my head. I watched this show when I was younger. (laughs) Quinn, wow, she had no other words. Nick, keep watching, it gets better. Quinn kept watching as Steve Austin adapted to his new abilities by running very fast, rescuing children, and punching through walls like a boss. Quinn discovered that his robot eye not only had infrared capabilities, but could also zoom to a 20 to 1 ratio. Unfortunately, his bionic parts were radioactive and would stop working in extreme cold. But on warmer days, Steve Austin's robot legs could reach speeds of 60 miles per hour, and his vertical jump was insane. Vertical jump means straight up. Quinn, if you had legs like that, you would school me at basketball. Nick, true dat. Quinn, if you had chest hair like that, you would get all the ladies. Nick, I don't need all the ladies, just one. Quinn didn't know how to respond to that. So she texted the silly emoticon face with the one eye closed and the tongue hanging out. Nick, I didn't mean you were my lady. Quinn, I know. Nick, I just meant how many ladies does one guy need? 
Quinn, right. Nick, anyway, now you've met Steve Austin. Quinn, yep. Nick, I guess I will see you tomorrow. Quinn, I guess you will. When Quinn rolled onto the basketball court the next morning, she didn't see Nick anywhere. I'm here, she texted. Where are you? Not blowing you off, Nick, te Nick texted back. I have a doctor's appointment this morning. My mom just told me. Quinn, physical therapy? Nick, yes. Quinn, good luck. Nick, thanks. Quinn, see you in study hall? With a question mark. Nick texted a thumbs up. Quinn slid her phone into her backpack. She dribbled her basketball to the foul line and got to work. Are you tired? Ivy asked in PE. You look tired. Quinn was tired. She had been up until after midnight texting with Nick, but she wasn't sure she should say this to Ivy. Even though they were good now, Quinn didn't want to rub their friend, her friendship with Nick in Ivy's face. It was safer to say, I'm still recovering from the sleepover. Me too, Ivy lowered her voice and the party. Yeah. The bell rang and Ivy looked around the gym. Where are Carm and Liz? I don't know. I didn't see them changing, did you? Quinn shook her head. Mr. Fenner blew his whistle. Stretch it out, people. Quinn and Ivy bent over the mat. After a few minutes of hamstring stretching, Lissa appeared. She wasn't dressed for P.E. She was wearing sparkly flip-flops and tight white jeans. You guys, Carm is freaking out. She needs us. Where is she, Ivy said. Locker room. As soon as Mr. Fenner was looking the other way, the three of them dashed across the gym and into the locker room. They found Carmen wedged under a sink, curled up in a ball. Carm, Ivy said, squatting down and waddling over to Carmen. What's going on? Carmen lifted her chin from her knees. Her eyes were red and puffy. Talk to us, Ivy said. Carmen shook her head. Carm, come on, you're scaring me. He told everyone, Carmen said softly. Who told everyone, Quinn said. She squatted down too, so did Lissa. Rob, from the party, Ivy said. Carmen nodded. My brother Marco just texted me. He said Rob's telling everyone he hooked up with some hot freshman named Carmen. At least he called you hot, Lissa said. Carmen frowned. We did not hook up. We just kissed. And anyway, that's not even the worst part. What's the worst part, Ivy said. Carmen shook her head. I can't say. Carm, Lissa said, putting a hand on Carmen's knee. This is us. You can say anything. Carmen let out a deep, shuddering breath. I let him take a picture of me at the party. It wasn't bad or anything. I was wearing all my clothes, but he texted it to all his friends. He texted, this girl is good to go. Carmi, Ivy cried. She reached out and wrapped her arms around Carmen's balled up body. What did your brother do? Lissa said. Punched him in the face, obviously. Obviously, Ivy said. Is Marco suspended, Lissa said. I don't know yet, Carmen sniffled. He texted from the principal's office. He's waiting for my parents. Oh, Carm, Lissa wrapped her arms around both Ivy and Carmen. Quinn stayed where she was. She felt stupid, but she had to ask, what does that mean, good to go? Lissa turned her head to the side, keeping her arms around Carmen. It's like saying she's easy. Like next time, Ivy said, maybe she will take her clothes off for the picture. Carmen, whose voice was muffled, said, there's not going to be a next time. That's for sure, Ivy said. And Lissa said, you messed with the wrong girl. I'm really worried, or sorry, I'm really sorry, Carmen, Quinn said. I know what it's like. Well, not the good to go part, but the rest of it. Lissa and Ivy peeled themselves off Carmen. Now everyone was looking at Quinn. For a moment, she hesitated. She wanted to tell the story to make Carmen feel better, but she wasn't ready to tell the whole thing. So she settled on a version of the truth. Last year, back in Boulder, I was at this Valentine's party and we were playing Seven Minutes in Heaven. You know the game. Three heads nodded. I went to the bathroom with this kid, Ethan, and basically nothing happened. I mean, he tried, but I wouldn't let him. He was being kind of, you know, handsy. So I told him to back off. But then when we came out of the bathroom, he told everyone at the party I did something I didn't do. What, Ivy said. You don't want to know. Yes, Carmen said, sitting straight up. Yes, we do. Something sexual, you know. Ooh, Lissa said. I know. You didn't, right, Ivy said. I didn't, Quinn said. And I told everyone at the party I didn't. I said Ethan was lying, but it didn't matter because no one believed me. They all believed him. That's awful, Ivy said. It was. It ruined my whole year. Quinn turned to Carmen. Sorry, I didn't mean to make this about me. Just, you're not alone, okay? 
Carmen nodded, wiping her nose on a crumpled up paper towel she'd been holding in her lap. Thanks, Quinn. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Suddenly, the door to the locker room opened and one of the Emmas poked her head in. Fenner told me to come get you guys. He said, and I quote, I'm in the mood to give out some detentions. Tell him Lissa's having a female emergency, Ivy said. Tell him she can't find something and she's wearing white jeans. Me? Lissa pointed to her chest. Why me? Because you never have something when you need it. You're always stealing mine and you're always wearing white jeans. That's not true. You're saying your jeans aren't white? No, my jeans are white, but I don't. You guys, Carmen said, cutting them off. I'm fine now. You can go back to the gym. We're not going anywhere, Ivy said to Emma, who was standing uncertainly in the doorway. Ivy said, I'm serious. Tell him we're searching for something. And if he wants to give out detention to someone for being a good friend, then he can give it to all of us. When Nick didn't show up to study hall, Quinn sent him a text. Where are you? I'm starting to think you're avoiding me, LOL. It took a few minutes, but Nick texted back. PT appointment went long. Quinn, everything okay? Nick, yeah, out to lunch with my mom. Chili's. Quinn, cool. A minute passed and then Nick texted again. This time it was a picture, dark and kind of blurry. Look what I'm wearing. Quinn squinted at her screen, squinted and squinted, and then it hit her. OMG, she texted. The, loomp the Oompa Loompas are out to lunch? Nick, not by choice. It's PT homework. Quinn, how do you feel? I don't know yet. Quinn, not to sound cheesy, but I'm proud of you. Nick, thanks. Gotta go. Mom hates texting at the table. Quinn, mine too. TTYL, talk to you later. Nick, smiley face. Okay, so the same thing happened to Carmen that happened to... Quinn, back in Boulder, it's very important, girls and boys, your reputation is everything. Neither one of these girls did anything wrong but kiss someone, yet these boys are telling everyone that they did a lot more than that. So just be mindful of that. The older you get, the worse people are about it. Chapter 14. The first chance Quinn got, she went, out, she went on her dad's computer and searched double leg amputation. After she discovered the correct medical term, she searched bilateral transfemoral amputation. She found articles, blogs, photo galleries, Facebook pages, and Twitter feeds. She learned that most new amputees are overwhelmed by how difficult it is to learn to walk on prostheses. She learned that achieving stability and balance is particularly challenging, and that even after months of hard work and physical therapy, patients can lose hope that they will ever be able to walk again. She learned that many of them, like Nick, default to wheelchair use just because it's easier. She learned that legs Nick had left were called residual limbs. She learned that those white stocking thingies he wore were called stump socks. She learned that there was a whole stump care regimen that Nick had to follow so his skin wouldn't break down. She learned that the metal legs she'd seen him using at the Shoreline North Medical Center were called short prosthetics with training feet. She learned that finding a comfortable sleep position is nearly impossible. Nick couldn't sleep with his residual limbs resting on a pillow because this would shorten his hip flexors. Nick couldn't sleep with a pillow between his legs but this, because this would lengthen the inner thigh muscles that kept his leg together and shorten the outer thigh muscles that kept his legs apart, both of which would make walking even more difficult. She learned, and this was the worst thing of all, that Nick could still feel pain in his feet and calves and knees, even though they were gone. Phantom pain, it was called. Quinn didn't know what to do with any of this information, so she just sat there staring at the computer, letting it all sink in. Q, Quinn jolted in the chair. You scared me. Sorry, her mom said. I didn't mean to sneak up on you. I just have to grab some paper. She reached past Quinn to a stack on the desk. What are you looking at? Nothing. Quinn tried to cover the screen, but Mo was already leaning in. Spouses, family members, and friends play a significant role in helping the amputee adjust to the disability. Mom, Quinn said, come on. Are you searching for ways to help Nick? I don't know, maybe. Quinn felt her face go warm. Honey, that is so, I'm so proud of you to have, to have you for a daughter. D did I tell you that enough? Do I tell you that enough, how proud I am? Quinn rolled her eyes. Mom, relax. I'm just saying, Nick's lucky to have you for a friend. Yeah, okay. Would you like to have him over for dinner some night this week? I could make lasagna. I don't know, maybe. Well, her mom said, think about it. He's welcome anytime. 
When Quinn came downstairs, when Quinn came downstairs later, there was a big glass jar of M&Ms on the kitchen counter. What's this? She said. Morning. <laughs> that, Mo said, looking up from the onions she was chopping, is a behavioral incentive for Julius. When he meets one of his goals, he gets a reward. Candy? Sometimes candy, sometimes a non-food incentive like extra TV time or a trip to the bookstore. So basically, you're bribing him. We're not bribing him, Mo said, sweeping the onions into a pot. We're offering him positive reinforcement. I thought Julius wasn't supposed to eat sugar or red 40. He shouldn't have a lot of it, but a little. Those are my concerns too, Quinn's dad said, strolling into the kitchen with a carrot in his hand. He planted a kiss on top of Quinn's head, tickling her scalp with his beard. Salve, Fila. Greetings, daughter, or hello, daughter. Hi, dad. If either of you has a better idea, Mo said, turning on the stove, have at it. But I'm the one going to Julius's team meetings at the Cove. I'm the one talking with his teachers on a daily basis. I'm the one. M&M's, Mo, Julius said, shuffling into the kitchen with one hand in the air. M&M's Monday. That's right, bud, Quinn's mom said, turning around and wiping her hands on a dish towel. Today is Monday. And those are M&M's in the jar. After you wash up for dinner, you may have an M&M. Quinn's dad opened his mouth to say something, but Mo stopped him. Phil, she said, don't. You, have been to, you haven't been to a single one of his meetings. Until you do, just don't. I have a job, Maureen, a job that allows Julius to go to that school and you to go to those meetings. If I don't show up for my job, too loud, Julius said, clapping his hands over his ears. Too loud, Phil. Phil, Quinn's mom said quietly, shooting him a look. Quinn's dad opened his mouth again. This time he took a bite of carrot. Does your dad ever take you to PT? Quinn sent the text to Nick and then she pulled down the shades in her room. She turned out the lights. She sat on her bed and inch by inch, she ran her fingers over her scalp. Anything there? No. Anything there? No. Anything there? Her phone pinged. Nick, where did that come from? Sorry, weird night here. Parents arguing about whose job it is to take Julius to his appointments. Nick, drop and give me 10. She said sorry in her text. He had her. She got down on the rug and banged out 10 push-ups in the dark. Then she hopped back on her bed and texted, bam. Nick, my dad never takes me to PT, just my mom. Quinn, why? Nick, not his thing. Quinn, what's not? Nick, I don't know. Hospitals? Weakness? Quinn, you're not weak. Nick, whatever. Quinn, you're not. What you're going through, learning to walk again, that takes strength. Oh, wait a minute. That takes SRS strength. I don't know what SRS is. Sorry. Nick texted a string of emojis she didn't recognize. Quinn, what are those? Nick, cheese balls because you're being a cheese ball. Quinn, speaking of cheese, my mom wants to know if you want to come over for lasagna. When? Quinn, whenever, some night this week. Nick, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Quinn scrolled back through her old text until she found the photo Nick had sent earlier of his Oompa Loompa legs under the table at Chili's. She retexted the photo with a new comment. These guys are invited too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nick didn't respond right away, making Quinn wonder if she'd made a mistake. But finally, her phone ping, pinged. I'll think about it. She texted back three smiley faces, which may have been overkill, but she didn't care. All right. I, got, I have to know what SRS means. So let's, and you guys might already know. Oh, serious. Okay. That's what it means. SRS means serious. So she means that takes serious strength. So I was right the first time. All right, chapter 15. On Tuesday morning, Mo was standing at the kitchen counter, just standing there staring out the window at the backyard. She was wearing her flannel PJ bottoms and a green silky blouse. Quinn stopped in the doorway. Mom? Mo turned around. She was wearing one gold hoop earring. There was toothpaste in the corner of her mouth. Hi, what's going on? Mo squeezed her eyes shut for a second. When she opened them, she said, did you hear the phone ring in the middle of the night? No, why? It was Grandma Gigi's nursing home. She fell on her way to the bathroom and broke her hip. 
Oh my God, Quinn felt her eyes prickle. She'll be okay. She's scheduled for surgery tomorrow morning. I need to fly to Phoenix for a few days. Okay, Quinn nodded, slowly processing. Are you bringing Julius? I have to. Right. Quinn couldn't picture Julius without Mo, even for 24 hours. Had she ever gone away? Quinn couldn't remember a time. But Julius in an airport? Mo shook her head. Julius on a plane all the way to Arizona? Right, Quinn said. She pictured Julius melting down at 35,000 feet. She pictured many bags of pretzels flying. He needs his routine, Mo said. He's just beginning to feel settled here. This is just horrible timing. There were sounds from upstairs, footsteps, the low rumble of voices. Now would have been a good opportunity for Quinn to say, don't worry about Julius, mom. He can stay. Dad and I know what to do. But she couldn't make the words come out. What about Uncle Andrew, Quinn said. Uncle Andrew was Mo's younger brother. They never saw him. He's in Australia. Since when? Since he took a teaching, teaching position at the University of Sydney. Okay, Quinn said. Nobody ever told her anything. That much was clear. I've been making lists. Quinn's mom shuffled some papers on the counter. School times, meals and snacks, transitional aids, positive reinforcements, phone numbers for all of his teachers and therapists. Wait, so you're not bringing Julius? Yes, her mom said. No, she shook her head so the single gold hoop earring swung. I don't know. Quinn thought, my mother is having a breakdown. Quinn thought, I need to say something. Mom, it'll be okay. Will it? Yes, Quinn said. Then George, Jeej needs you right now. I know. If you bring Julius, you won't really be there for her. Quinn's mom huffed out a breath. I know. Leave him here, Quinn said. He'll be fine. We'll know what to do. We know what to do. Mo smiled a little. That's just what your father said. Because it's true. There was no reason to assume that Quinn and her dad couldn't handle the job. They'd known Julius as long as Mo had. Listen, Quinn said. From upstairs, Phil's deep voice came singing. You put your right foot in, you put your left foot in. Julius is putting on his pants. And when he comes downstairs, I will make breakfast tacos. Because it's Tuesday. Breakfast tacos weren't hard to make. They were just scrambled eggs and bacon wrapped in little tortilla sleeping bags. Okay? Quinn's mom nodded. Okay. Why don't you go put on some pants? Mom looked at her PJ bottoms. And your other earring. Mo reached up to touch her empty earlobe. Yes. She started to walk out of the kitchen. Then she stopped in the doorway and turned around. You and dad can call me anytime, you know, with questions. You just won't be able to reach me when I'm on the plane. She frowned. Maybe not at the hospital either. In certain rooms, they make you turn off your cell because the signal interferes with the medical equipment. But you can always leave me a message and I'll call you right back. Mom, we'll be fine. Are you sure? Quinn wasn't sure, but she nodded. Yes. Mo took a deep breath and plastered on a smile. Thank you, honey. You're welcome. Okay, so her mom is getting ready to go to Arizona for, I'm sure, a few days if her mother's having surgery, which is um, Quinn's grandmother. What do we think is going to happen with Julius? Is everything going to be okay or is something crazy going to happen? Quinn let her parents drive her to school. This seemed to be what Quinn's mom needed before she went to the airport. I want to see you off properly, Mo said, which didn't sound like her. See you off properly? Since when had their family done anything properly? When Quinn thought of proper, she thought of Queen Elizabeth serving crumpets from a silver-plated tea service, not Phil riding shotgun with his white frame sunglasses from the 1980s, or Mo with her messy ponytail and crooked red lipstick, shooting manic smiles in the rearview mirror. Manic smiles would be like this, you know, like she's trying to make sure everything's okay, but she looks freaked out. Quinn's mom never wore lipstick. Quinn had no idea why she was wearing it now. This is going to be an adventure, Mo said, for the fourth or fifth time. Right, bud? Julius wasn't even listening. He had his headphones on. He was muttering to himself and staring out the window. Quinn wanted to tell her mother to relax. She wanted to say, he's fine. See, he doesn't need you as much as you think he does. But Quinn didn't want to say anything that would make her mom act any crazier than she already was. You can still come over, Quinn told Nick in study hall after she explained about Grandma Gigi. My mom just won't be there, so, you know, no lasagna. But we can still hang out. Okay. My dad won't get home from picking up Julius at least 4 o'clock. 
just for timing purposes with the stairs if you need help. Okay. If your dad drops you off, probably the two of us could do it, or your mom. She's used to lifting your chair, right? Quinn, Nick said. Yeah. Shut up. Quinn nodded. Right. You don't need to worry about me. Okay. Are you still coming over? Yes, weirdo, Nick said. I'm still coming over. When Nick's car pulled into Quinn's driveway, Quinn was already there working on some of her skateboarding tricks. The ollie, the nollie, the no comply, and this new one she'd been trying to master called the disco flip, where you ollie and pop and kick the front foot for the heel flip. Then you turn your shoulders backside while you make the flip and continue to rotate your body. You only need to rotate 90 degrees and you can throw your feet on the board in reverse, catch it, and roll away. Quinn was doing the roll away when she saw Nick's car pull in. She hopped off her board and waved. When Quinn saw Nick get out of the passenger seat on his short metal legs, she tried not to smile. She made her face completely neutral as she walked over. Hi, Mrs. Strout, she said, holding out her hand. I'm Quinn. Nick's mom had dark wavy hair and a square jaw, just like Tommy's. She was shorter than Quinn by a few inches, and her hands were small, but her grip was strong. Nice to meet you, Quinn. You too. Wow, you can really skateboard. Thanks, Quinn smiled. She turned to Nick. Hey. Hey, he said gruffly. He didn't meet Quinn's eyes. She wanted to tell him not to feel self-conscious. She didn't care how short his legs were. Nikki, his mom said, do you want some help getting up those stairs? No. Are you sure? Mrs. Strout frowned at the slate steps. They look pretty steep and there's no railing. I've got it. You can go. Quinn watched Nick's mom start to move in for the kiss, then hesitate, then smooch him on the head anyway. Mom, he said in a strangled voice. Sorry, his mom said. Bye, honey. Bye, Quinn. Bye, Mrs. Strout. Watching Nick navigate the front steps was like watching one of those puppets on strings because his prosthetics had no knee joints. He had to lean all the way to one side to lift the opposite leg to the next. Then he had to stand straight up and balance on one metal foot before leaning all the way to the other side and lifting the opposite leg up. It looked really hard. It took forever. Quinn wanted to cheer him up, to cheer him on, to offer words of encouragement each time he scaled another step. But she knew Nick well enough by now to keep her mouth shut. The only time she opened it was when he got to the top and she said, you want a Coke? Julius didn't exactly ruin everything, but he didn't help either. Maybe 10 minutes after Quinn got Nick's Coke, Julius pounded on the front door. As soon as Quinn opened it and heard him muttering, Mo, Mo makes my snack, Mo makes my snack, she knew. Rough day, she said to her dad. He was trailing behind Julius, Guinness World Records 2017 in one hand and yellow headphones in the other. His glasses were smudged and there was a blotchy red stain on his white shirt. You have no idea. Hi, Julius, Quinn said, even though she knew it was pointless. How was school today? Mo picks me up, Julius said to the coat rack. Mo. He paused to do one of his rock and roll moves, shifting his weight forward and backward, snapping his fingers high in the air. Mo picks me up. Right, Quinn said, turning back to her father. So, Dad, Nick's here. He's in the bathroom right now, but I just wanted to let you know before he comes out. Legs, Julius said, not quietly. Legs, legs, legs. Quinn swore under her breath. She tried to catch Nick's eye to tell him she was sorry, but he wasn't looking at her. He was standing in the doorway watching her brother. Hi, Nick. Quinn's dad tucked the book under his elbow and walked briskly past Julius to shake Nick's hand. Nice to see you again. Svetlana Pankratova of Russia has the world's longest legs. Of course, Quinn thought. Of course, this was happening right now. She closed her eyes. Verified as measuring 132 centimeters, 51.9 inches in Torremolinas, Spain on 8 July 2003. I'm very sorry, Quinn's dad murmured. He's a little thrown off by his mother being out of town. Quinn opened her eyes and shot her dad a look, but he was focused on Julius. Bud, you remember Nick. Can you say hello? Snap, flap, kick, the triple threat. Nick took a few halting steps forwards. Hi, Julius. Wheels. Oh, dear Lord, if Quinn could have grabbed Nick under her arm like a football and run him out of the house, she would have. That's right, Nick said to Julius. The last time you saw me, I had my wheels. This time I have my legs. Julius stopped moving for about a nanosecond. They're short. Yeah, Nick said they are because they don't have knees. Largest game of head, shoulders, knees, and toes. 
If Quinn's dad hadn't been there as a witness, Ken, Quinn might not have believed what she was hearing herself. Julius and Nick were having a conversation, kind of. And the only people Julius had conversations with were Mo, Phil, and Q. So this is a really big deal for him, especially since Nick was not in his wheelchair as that's how Julius first met him. So it's a big deal that he's talking to him back and forth. What are you making? Quinn asked her dad later. Julius was watching TV. Nick was in Mo's studio putting the finishing touches on his sculpture's nose, which didn't look half bad. Pizza, her dad said. He was standing at the kitchen counter rolling out the dough. Seriously, Quinn said. Her dad grinned. He had flour on his nose. When you were little, we used to make pizza together every Friday night. Do you remember? Quinn shook her head. It's Tuesday. We can pretend it's Friday. Hello, Taco Tuesday. Quinn walked over to the refrigerator where her mom had tacked up all her instructions. Quinn tapped the meal plan with her finger. Tuesday dinner, tacos, ground beef in the fridge, chop the tomatoes as small as possible, use the tomatillo salsa. Did you even read this? I read it and I decided to make pizza. Dad, Quinn said, mom wrote this down for a reason. She knows what she's doing. So do I, Quinn's dad said, slopping a spoonful of sauce onto his rolled out dough. Tonight, we're trying something new, Phil's rules. Quinn stared at him. Phil's rules? Phil's rules, he repeated, smoothing the sauce with the back of a spoon. You're going rogue. I'm expanding your brother's culinary horizons. Just for the record, Quinn said, I think you're making a mistake. Maybe. Julius is going to flip out. Possibly. Let's see what happens. Do we think Julius is going to flip out because Phil's making pizza instead of tacos on Taco Tuesday? My inference would be probably. What happened was hand flapping and finger snapping and foot kicking and ear smacking and Taco Tuesday, Phil, Taco Tuesday, Taco Tuesday, Phil, Taco Tuesday, Phil, Taco Tuesday, Phil, until finally Julius grabbed the freshly baked pizza off the stovetop and flung it across the kitchen like a discus, splattering sauce and cheese everywhere. Quinn's dad stared at the mess. Quinn stared at her dad. Julius smacked his ears. You know, Nick said, there's a Mexican place in town that delivers. La Cucaracha. La Cucaracha. They make really good tacos. Quinn's dad turned to Nick and said, Duce Benedict Benedicat. Nick looked at Quinn. It's Latin, she said. He's just blessed you. So, Quinn said when she and Nick were standing out on the front lawn, waiting for Nick's mom to pick him up. Have we scared you away forever? I don't scare that easy, Nick said. You don't? Nah. You should see some of the blowouts at my house when all my brothers are home. One Thanksgiving, Kip threw the vacuum across the dining room at, Cap at Gavin. It landed on the turkey. Quinn laughed. Really? Yeah, my mom was so mad. It was still a little unreal to Quinn that Nick was standing here on her front lawn, literally standing. Going down the stairs had been tricky. A few times, Quinn had almost reached out to grab his arm, but it turned out she didn't have to. Speak of the devil, Nick said as his mom's car pulled into the driveway. He started walking, slow, wobbly steps down the path. Hey, Quinn said, walking behind him. Thanks for suggesting that Mexican place. The tacos were really good. I know, right? I like the hot sauce, Quinn said, and I don't usually like hot sauce. I like you, Nick said. At least... That's what Quinn thought she heard. That's what it sounded like. But he was facing the other direction, and his mom's car was running, so it was kind of hard to hear. What? she said. But Nick was already getting into the front seat, saying something to his mom. Now he was waving goodbye to Quinn, a regular wave, not an I like you sort of wave. So probably what he said was, I like juice, which is what they'd had to drink with their tacos, grape juice. Yeah, Quinn thought as she waved back. I like juice. That made more sense. That's the end of chapter 15. Did he say I like juice or did he say I like you? We will pick up tomorrow and find out. Have a tremendous Thursday. Enjoy your day. Uh, it's crazy hair, crazy hat, crazy socks. I have to wait for my hair to dry to do that. But I do have my hat and socks. I hope you all are having fun at home and participating. I haven't been emailed any pictures, so do that if you would like. And I will see you all tomorrow on Friday. Bye.